I will start by saying a sincere thank you to the great people of Kootenai, Columbia for giving me the honour of representing them in Canada's 42nd Parliament. It is a responsibility that I take very seriously as I have devoted my life to public service. I would also like to congratulate the citizens of the Kootenays from Elkford to Revelstoke and from Caslow to Field for their outstanding participation in the 2015 election. Almost 74% of eligible voters in my riding took that walk to the polls amongst the highest turnout in Canada. I'm particularly proud of the number of First Nations people and youth who are actively involved in the election. This is very good news for the future of reconciliation with our Indigenous neighbours and for the future of democracy in the southeast corner of British Columbia. And of course, I'd like to thank my wife Audrey and my children Sean, Kelly and Adrian and my granddaughter Lalita for their love and support. Their sacrifices are what made this journey possible. The citizens of the Rocky, Purcell and Selkirk Mountains sent me to Ottawa with some very ex specific expectations that I intend to deliver on. First, to work together with all parties to deliver on a better future for Kootenai Columbia and for Canada. My constituents, quite frankly, are tired of seeing Parliament as a place where partisan politics seem to take precedence over positive progress. Their desire, and mine, is to see the House of Commons as a place where good ideas are celebrated regardless of their origins. I was heartened, Mr. Speaker, to hear that your desire is also to see a better future for Parliament. The second expectation is for me to hold the Liberal government accountable for their election promises and to make them even better. I will do that alongside my new Democrat colleagues by supporting the government when they are doing the right things for King the Government, when they are doing the right things for Canada. We demonstrated our willingness to cooperate last Friday when we stood and applauded the objectives from the speech from the throne related to electoral reform, to making Canada a leader dealing with climate change, to immediately launch an inquiry into missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls, and in welcoming Syrian refugees to Canada. These are all priorities for the citizens of Kootenai, Columbia. But my constituents have many other priorities that they expect us to deliver on as well. I personally locked on over a thousand doors during the 2015 election. In 2015 election. And here are some of the things that I heard very clearly. Families with young children want universal, affordable childcare. We had a plan to give them that, and they want to know your plan to help them get there. Small businesses need and deserve a tax cut and a reduction in credit card fees. Too many seniors are living in poverty. This is unacceptable in a rich country like Canada, a country that these senior citizens help to build an increase in the Guaranteed Income Supplement. Bill C-51 needs to be repealed, not just amended. Constituents describe C-51 as the anti-terrorist fear-mongering bill. They believe, as do I and many legal scholars, that this bill has the potential to go too far in impacting our rights and freedoms without adding any real benefits to our security. The Trans-Pacific Trade Partnership has the potential to hurt the dairy and cheese industry, particularly in the Creston area of my riding. We should never sign any trade deal that negatively impacts any aspect of agriculture. Food security should be a fundamental right protected by all levels of government. Healthcare is a concern for all Canadians, and while I am optimistic and encouraged by the government's promise to negotiate a new health accord, with the provinces and territories, it remains to be seen if that accord will deal with long-standing issues related to the requirement for every Canadian to have a family doctor, reducing costs for prescription drugs, helping children and youth struggling with mental illness, 
tabling a Bill of Rights for people with disabilities, ensuring that seniors have the help that they need at home, in long-term care facilities, in hospitals, and through palliative care. And my constituents also want to see a vibrant and well-funded CBC and mail delivered to their homes by Canada Post. It seems as is the case with many things in life, the devil is in the details. For example, leadership in climate change is a good thing, but it is meaningful only if accompanied by firm, enforceable, and timely targets. Implementing recommendations from the Truth and Reconcili Reconciliation Commission of Canada is the right thing to do, but in the end, which recommendations and how they are implemented will be the true measure of the government's commitment to the First Nation. It was great to have the Prime Minister stop by the orientation session for new members of Parliament back in November. As part of his address to us, he said that the role of the opposition is to make government better. I couldn't agree more. And as part of Canada's progressive opposition, that is exactly what we will do. One of my disappointments with the speech from the throne is that it fails to make any mention of Canada's national parks. When I reviewed the mandate letter from the Prime Minister to the Honourable Minister of Environment and Climate Change, I was heartened to read statements related to developing Canada's national park commercial development within them. However, during the campaign, the Liberal, Liberal government also promised to invest $25 million each year to protect ecosystems and species at risk in parks, as well as to manage and expand national wildlife areas and migratory bird sanctuaries, and to reverse the Conservative government's cuts to Parks Canada and restore $25 million to programs and services. Help to programs and services. I will be closely monitoring the Liberal government's budget to ensure that national parks which are important to both our environment and our economy, get the enhanced funding that they rightfully deserve. We also need to ensure that there is a solid long-term plan to twin Highway 1 through the national parks in my riding, while ensuring the safety of both travelers and wildlife, and to see a new national park established in British Columbia's South Okanagan region, which is a long-standing initiative. I'm going to finish my maiden speech to Parliament with a story. When I was going door to door during the campaign in Nelson, I met a delightful senior citizen who said she wanted to tell me a story, but only if I agreed to share it with others. After hearing her story, I said that I would do just that. When this senior was a child, her father was friends with Tommy Douglas, and she often played around his feet. Apparently, Mr. Douglas was of rather small stature. One day she was in a room with several adults. One of them was a very tall man who was standing by Tommy Douglas. One of the other adults looked at the two of them and said, Mr. Douglas, you sure are short. To which Tommy Douglas replied, the true height of a man is measured from the neck up. <laughs> Of course, Mr. Douglas went on to be the father of Canada's universal health care system, of which we are all so proud. Why am I telling you this story? Because while we as a caucus may be short in numbers, we are long on good ideas that will make our country stand even taller. And I am committed to working with all of you over the next four years to build a better Kootenai Columbia and a better Canada. President, Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'd like to uh, congratulate you on your election. I served on a committee under you, and you were always very fair, and I think that helped lead to your election. And I wanted to, first chance I have to uh, thank my constituents. It was very um, heartfelt for me going door to door, and they uh, many thanked me for what I've done in the past, and I take that very seriously, and I hope I can live up to uh, the trust they placed in me. And I'd also thank the Conservative NDP and Green Party for help, and all the workers of every party that helped uh, uh, were soldiers of democracy. And most of all, to thank my uh, wife, Melissa, and my children, Dawson and Aurora, uh, for 
uh, missing so much time with me. I'd like to thank the member for an excellent, very positive speech, and particularly in uh, National Parks. Uh, I applaud what he said, and just to remind people that the $25 million in cuts in 2012 really hurt us. We're going to put uh, that back to $25 million more for ecosystems. Um, in 2017, in the 150th anniversary of the parks, it'll be free for everyone. And after that, forever free for children. And the year after, free for one year for uh, new Canadians, which I think is very exciting. And finally, there's to be an increase, huge increase in marine parks in Canada to help us catch up to the rest of the world and protect those ecosystems. And I hope the member is in support of all those items. The Honourable Member for Kootenai, Columbia. Yes, thank you. National parks are extremely important, as I said, to both our economy and the environment. I'm very fortunate in Kootenai, Columbia, to have four national parks in my riding. Uh, we very much need to make sure we're putting more attention and financing into it. They've been really hurt, quite frankly, over the last 10 years and the last four years in particular, and they deserve much better in the future. Questions and comments? Yes, and commentaire. Uh, on la deputée, the Honourable Member. Churchill. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and I want to thank my colleague for his excellent first speech in the House. We're so happy that uh, uh, that he is here along with a robust team from British Columbia, and uh, and I think he really spoke to uh, to our priorities uh, uh, overall as a as a caucus. And I'm wondering if if um, uh, he, he brought up some key points in terms of a, an issue where where we're proud to stand very clearly on, and that's on Bill C51. Uh, there's so many Canadians from coast to coast to coast that expressed uh, their opposition uh, to this bill, uh, that are expressed their concern about what this bill means in terms of civil liberties, in terms of privacy, uh, in terms of uh, <clears throat> respect for uh, uh, First Nations rights. And, uh, uh, and, and despite the severity of, of the issues that have been made known by many uh, across the country, uh, the government across uh, did not refer to uh, the changes uh, that it's looking at making or, or frankly did not refer to uh, any of, uh, of, uh, of its plans with regards to C-51 in the throne speech. How important is it uh, for, uh, for Canadians to see leadership on this front, to see that their civil rights, uh, that their right to privacy, that Indigenous rights are protected? Uh, I'd like to hear from our, uh, my colleague on this front. The Honourable Member for Kootenai, Columbia. Thank you for the question. You know, one of the most important things I heard over and over again in my writing during the campaign was the need to repeal Bill C-51. Quite frankly, I, I spoke with a number of longtime liberals, actually, as well in my writing, who were changing their vote this time around uh, because of the liberal support for at least the first version of Bill C-51. So they wanted to see the bill repealed. Uh, I yeah. know the Liberal government's position has been... Yeah. Security, who said that they did not think the bill would provide really much additional security to Canadians at all, Thanks. while potentially impacting our rights and freedoms. It should be repealed. Well, that's, uh, that's all the time we have for questions and comments on that round, and uh, we'll go to uh, resuming.